Hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for coming to our webinar. And I just want to uh, welcome everybody and let you know that our webinar is being recorded. And that's important for us if you want to review some of the information later. Um, just want to let you know that. Hi, I'm Carol Marshart. I am the Executive Director of AXIS. And you can find us at genetic.org. This webinar is, series was sponsored by Claris Therapeutic, and we appreciate their support. Our mission at AXIS is to help individuals with one or more extra X or Y chromosomes in their families live fuller, more productive lives. We do this through support, education, research, and treatment. And we want, we're really excited about today's webinar because this embodies the mission of AXIS. I want to invite you all to join our AXIS Family Conference this June. Uh, if you register before March 15th, you can get a discounted rate and you can find that at genetic.org, uh, the family conference, and it's right at the top of our homepage as well. The members who are speaking today, so Susan and Dr. Tartaglia and Dr. Davis, are members of our Access Clinical and Research Consortium. As a matter of fact, the Extraordinary Kids Clinic in Denver was the founding clinic of this group. What's wonderful about this group is we have clinics where the most trained doctors can help see people in the access community and also where research is conducted. Want to make sure you know access has a helpline and we have a brand new helpline phone number. So make a note of that. People call their email and they're paired with callers. They're paired with a, a trained volunteer with whatever kind of question they have, whether that's legal, educational, someone with a prenatal diagnosis, diagnosis, and we just try to help everyone who, who calls us. We have a library on our website with many research articles, including the article we're going to speak about today. And we have a webinar series and a YouTube channel. So this webinar will end up on our YouTube channel and we're really excited about that. So please check it out when you have questions. If you want to donate to AXIS, you can text to 484-228-7139, the words give or donate, and that'll send you a link to complete our donation. What we're really excited about today is this is a full circle. So that Extraordinary Kids Clinic sees individuals from the AXIS community. They're able then to participate in research studies. When our clinic has studies to talk about, they tell us at AXIS and we can share them with our community who can then be a part of the study. Then when that study is done by these amazing doctors and they get it published in a journal, they share the research back with us and now we can then share it back with you. So I just want to welcome Dr. Davis, Dr. Tartaglia and Susan Howell, who is also an AXIS board member. Thank you all for being here. Okay, so I'm going to start. Um, and like Carol said, um, Dr. Davis and Ms. Susan Howell are going to join me in terms of talking about this study as well. So the title of this talk is Risk for Early Ovarian Failure in Girls with Trisomy X Syndrome. Um, this is a long outline, but this is our plan. We're going to kind of review some anatomy and definitions. We'll talk about some previous research in Trisomy X. We'll talk about the objective of this study. Well, um, Dr. Davis will give an overview of AMH and the study results and then um, implications of the findings. Um, we're going to talk about unanswered questions and future directions. And then Susan will um, give us additional information about kind of how to talk with your doctor and how to talk with your daughter about these results. And then at the end, we'll have a question and answer session. I just want to make sure with the question and answers that we can't answer specific care questions about your specific child. We can answer a lot of general questions, but we can't give medical advice on a webinar. Okay, so just to review some anatomy, um, this is you know the female reproductive system with the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and the ovaries. And to remind you, there's two functions of the ovaries. The first is to store and release eggs, or what we also call oocytes. And the second is to produce reproductive hormones, which include estrogen, many different kinds of variations of estrogen, progesterone, and other um, hormones. So what is then ovarian failure? So ovarian failure um, is when the ovaries stop producing eggs and when menstrual periods stop. So natural ovarian failure is what we call menopause. Um, 
In the U.S., the average age of menopause is usually between 45 to 55 years of age with a mean age of 51. So you can see this peak over here, 51, um, you know, have men is the mean age of menopause. And then premature ovarian failure sometimes is also called primary ovarian insufficiency. So sometimes you'll hear it called POF or POF. Other times you'll hear they're called POI, P-O-I. And basically that definition of that is loss of ovarian function and loss of fertility before age 40 or kind of menopause before age 40. So if you draw the line of menopause here at age 40, you can see here there is a little clump and a little bleep of people um, who definitely have menopause before 40, but the majority over here um, are after 40. Um, so then the next question is kind of what do we know about ovarian failure in trisomy X? Um, and so this um, quote, lassitude and flushes, I'll explain to you, but um, I think is kind of um, important and, and humorous in some ways because it's definitely using old term language. So the first case report of trisomy X was actually reported in the medical literature in 1959. And it, the title of the paper was Evidence for the Existence of the Human Superfemale. And this was published when the first author was Dr. Patricia Jacobs, who's done a lot of important work in our XMI chromosome field. Um, and so in this case, of uh, the first case report of trisomy X, it was actually a 19-year-old girl who had stopped having periods. And they described that um, in addition to, you know, stopping having menses, it was also associated with lassitude and flushes. And so to me, I said, well, flushes are probably like hot flashes, but I honestly did. I didn't know what the lassitude actually mean. So I looked it up on Google, of course, and it is a state of physical or mental weariness or lack of energy. Um, and so, you know, this, the very first case of trisomy X was actually presented and described because of um, ovarian failure early at 19 years of age. Um, so what else do we know? Well, you know, there's a lot of literature on this, but there are always like one or two case reports and one or two case reports and then a review of the other one or two case reports, but there really hasn't been a lot of um, good literature, um, with the exception of a you know fairly recent um, publication from Italy that actually had some um, a kind of good sample size of trisomy. But we know in the multiple previous case reports, there's definitely reports of, of premature ovarian failure, and you know in one or two patients. So it's been reported for sure multiple times in the literature. Um, there's a lot of different reports of women with trisomy X um, who had other, um, you know, loss of um, fertility or amenorrhea, but also kind of findings of abnormal ovaries, small ovaries, no ovaries, or low numbers of eggs in the ovaries. And so, you know, but again, these are all mostly done on very small numbers or only one single individual with trisomy X. Um, when they actually do, there's a lot of studies that look at primary ovarian failure, right? What is the cause of early fertility? And so um, there's a lot of studies where they take big samples of patients who have um, POF or premature ovarian failure, and then they do genetic testing on those patients. And so these results are, you know, there's, and I could go on with a whole list of here, but two out of 52, women, so 52 women with, with POF were tested, two of them ended up with trisomy X. So that's 3.8%, 531 in this sample, 0.5%, 2.2%, 4%, 3.3%. We know from the perspective of when you're evaluating for, for POF, um, that there is a percentage of women who are identified with trisomy X. Um, and so that is important. And we know that, you know, anywhere from one to 4% of patients um, with POF have trisomy X. But what we don't know is the other way around. And that's where, you know, we, for us to be able to give counseling and, and um, information in terms of treatment, um, we don't know what percent of patients with trisomy X actually go on to develop um, POI or POF. Um, we do know a few things about fertility in trisomy X. We know that many women with trisomy X have had normal fertility. They bear children. Some women are identified when they are pregnant or, um, you know, having genetic testing um, related to pregnancies. There was a prospective study of um, 
children from this born in the 70s and 80s here in Denver that were followed all the way through to adulthood. And eight of the 11 girls that were followed from birth through adulthood got pregnant um, by young adulthood. And then we know kind of, like I said, many women are discovered to have trisomy X when they're being evaluated for infertility. And so, um, you know, we know that many women with trisomy X are fertile, but there's also some challenges um, with infertility and so. Um, I've had patients also who have gone on to, you know, be married and have in, have babies and all those things too. So the current study is, um, you know, what parents always ask us in clinic. Well, so what does all of that research actually mean for my child um, or for me as a woman with trisomy X? And so that leads me and my team to ask, well, what can we do to start to better understand this in the girls and women with trisomy X? And so the objective of this study was to explore what we call a biomarker of ovarian function in patients with trisomy X who are seen in our clinic. And the, uh, the definition of a biomarker is something that you can measure biologically, so a biological measurement of a substance that indicates the presence of a medical condition or a medical finding. And so um, the biological um, you know, biomarker that we're measuring in this study is AMH, and Dr. Davis will tell us a lot more about AMH. So now, Dr. Davis. All right, sounds good. Um, I think that there were some mentions as well. If anyone has questions, you guys can start typing them in the chat and we'll answer them at the end. So um, AMH is, stands for anti-malarian hormone. And this is a hormone that's made by um, certain follicles in the ovary and follicles are just another word for eggs. Um, during a specific stage that they're maturing, the um, granulosa cells in these antral follicles, which we'll show on the next page, secrete or make this hormone AMH. We don't necessarily know what the purpose of AMH is. It might be supporting some of the maturation of those eggs, um, but really it's a reflection of that those eggs are there and, um, and that it, we can track that over time. We can measure it in the blood. And when we look at AMH levels throughout the woman's um, life, they, they stay pretty stable until they start to decline at the time they're nearing menopause, like Dr. Tartaglia was talking about. So on average, um, if you can see my mouse here, which you probably can't because it's actually Dr. Tartaglia's screen. Could you just point to the median line there, Nicole? Thank you. Um, so Dr. Tartaglia is pointing to that median line. That's kind of the average line of, of where most women will fall for AMH levels, or these are actually girls, sorry, from zero to 15 years of age. So it's pretty stable. There's some fluctu fluctuation or variability over time, but it's around two nanograms per mil. I think the, the numbers on the side there got a little messed up. If your level falls below one nanogram per mil, that's concerning for that you don't have enough of those eggs that are currently making um, that AMH hormone. And it's a marker of kind of how many eggs you have left in storage. Can you go to the next slide? Oh, okay. Well, I, I did have a picture I thought of, of eggs in there, but in any case, during a woman is born, a girl is born with all of the primordial eggs that they will ever have. And then they mature over time um, until you reach menopause and then you have no eggs left. And so this process of maturing um, at one of those stages in maturation is when they're making um, AMH levels or making that hormone AMH. And so we can measure this as a marker of kind of how many eggs you have left in reserve. Um, so this study design um, was uh, primarily done by Dr. Tartaglia in that the girls that she would see in clinic, she offered um, that to draw an AMH level. This is something that you can monitor clinically. And um, she also took a history of their puberty. So when they started puberty, what signs of puberty they had, and when they started to have periods or their menstrual cycles, and then how regular were they, um, et cetera. And then what we did is we um, compared those results to girls that were in a different study in the endocrine department with um, no known genetic or puberty problems that had also had AMH measured at the same lab that we were sending this blood work to. Next slide. 
So these are um, a summary of the participants that we put in the paper. So there were a total of 15 girls with trisomy X, which is that first column there. And there were 26 girls without trisomy X that we put in the control column. And you can see that they were all around um, 13 to 15 years age of age. So that was their average age. Um, the range went from, as we had one girl as young as five years old, but most of them were kind of in the 12 to 18 range. Um, you can see here that some of the other, what we call metrics um, in girls with trisomy X that were different than controls include that they were taller. That's something that we know. They um, had a BMI that was a little bit lower compared to the controls. Our controls tended to be more obese actually in this study. Um, they both had about half of the group had other chronic medical conditions. And these things included things like asthma or um, um, GI conditions and things like that. Um, one uh, thing to note is that the group with trisomy X um, did all have some sort of neuropsychological diagnosis. So that could have been ADHD or anxiety or various other things compared to only about a quarter percent, uh, sorry, a quarter of the controls. So I'm gonna take a break for a second here and walk through a little bit of what normal puberty looks like in girls. So breast development starts somewhere between ages eight to 13 in the 95% of girls. If you start before age eight, we call it premature puberty. And if you start after age 13, we call it delayed puberty. Um, likewise, the first period we call menarche usually occurs in a range of nine to 14 years with the average age being about 12 and a half. Um, and periods can be irregular for the first one to two years after you start having periods. There's a, a natural progression of breast development as well as pubic hair development that we call tanner staging or, or sexual maturation rating, depending upon what scale you want to call it. But um, this is usually you'll have periods that are starting somewhere between um, a breast development of tanner three and tanner four here. All right, so um, in our study of the 15 girls with puberty, or sorry, of the 15 girls with trisomy X, one actually had a diagnosis of delayed puberty. So she had no breast development yet and she was over 13 years of age. Um, of the ones that did have uh, puberty and uh, menarche, the average age of their first period was 12 and a half years. So this is exactly normal. And two thirds of the girls were already having regular periods. The um, one third that weren't having regular periods were still, um, most of them were still within one to two years of their first period starting. And so it's not technically abnormal to have irregular periods at that time. Most of their other reproductive hormones that we look at, including the hormones that come from your pituitary gland in your brain, um, estradiol, et cetera, were normal. Um, so we're gonna really focus on the AMH. All right, so um, our conclusion here, the take home is that we found that AMH levels were lower in girls with trisomy X. And that's what this first, um, perfect. Um, so that is the, um, each of those dots represent one of the individual girls in our study. And the bars there, the, the middle bar represents the, the median or kind of what you can think about as the average. Um, you can see there that that dotted line is at one and that is what the normal range is. So you should be above that one in order to have normal ovarian function for this age. And you can see that a lot of the girls with trisomy X are falling underneath that um, normal range. And in fact, the median was below that normal range. And that was significantly lower than the control group, which you can see had more spread, but was certainly higher on average. Then we looked at the percent of girls that fell underneath that um, one or that normal range. And you can see that it is about 65% that had an AMH level below one um, or two thirds of the girls, I guess 67% had an AMH level below one. And that was significantly more than the controls. Oh, there's the, there's the, <laughs> the ovary slide, wrong place. Um, I'll just point this out here that uh, th these lines here are pointing to the AMH. Thank you. Um, so those are the stage of the maturation of the, um, of the eggs as they're maturing over time that they're producing AMH. And so they're, they're a little bit at the beginning, but then also as they get further down the line. And, and as it's maturing, um, the amount or the number of eggs that are maturing really reflect how many eggs you have left in that pool. And so that's why it is a marker of kind of your ovarian reserve or how much, how many eggs you have left. Okay, next page. 
All right, back to the results. So this is looking at the girls over, um, uh, so you can plot it by age. So on the x-axis here is ages 10 through 19. So the majority of the girls in this study and each of those dots represent one of the girls. The black dots are girls with trisomy X and the open circles are girls um, that don't have trisomy X or controls. And the gray background is the normal range of where AMH levels should be that we consider them normal um, based on the lab. And this is just to show you that um, yes, we still see a lot of them below that normal range. We saw that on the last slide, but it doesn't really um, have any relationship to age. Um, both girls that are as young as, you know, in the 10 and even our five-year-old had an AMH less than one um, all the way up to 19. Um, there wasn't really a, a pattern with age that you can see. All right, so we had a couple girls that had a couple, uh, two levels of AMH measured over time, about a year apart, but that wasn't exact. Um, and really, it looked like it stayed in that same category. So one of the girls had a normal AMH when they first measured it. At the second time, it stayed normal. Three of the girls had a low AMH, and the second time they measured it, it stayed low. Um, although I think Dr. Tartaglia has since had one or two patients that have actually went from a low AMH to a normal AMH. And so I think that you have to take this um, these data with a little grain of salt. We really don't know what happens over time. And that longitudinal perspective is something we really need to, to think about when we're interpreting the, the, uh, what this means um, for girls right now. All right, I just wanted to spend a couple um, slides talking a little bit about, okay, well, what it, what does this even mean? What would we be able to do about this if, um, if we do have a risk for premature ovarian insufficiency in girls with trisomy X and say my daughter is in that group that she has low and falling AMH? Um, so these are some methods of what is currently done in the reproductive endocrinology world. So embryo cryopreservation, cryopreservation just means um, freezing for later, basically, story, storing it frozen. Um, that embryo cryopreservation means that you take the egg and you, the sperm and you put them together and you make an embryo and that embryo is then frozen. And then when you're ready to have a baby or get pregnant, you defrost that embryo and, and um, implant it into the uterus. This has been standard of care for many, many years. Years. Um, the uh, uh, doesn't really apply necessarily to these conditions because in pediatrics, you probably don't have a partner that you're going to have sperm for, um, and you're not necessarily ready to, to um, make that commitment yet. And so I'm just putting that in there for background perspective. Mature oocyte cryopreservation is saying, okay, we're going to take eggs from a girl that's already um, menstruating, so already um, sexually mature, having cycles, and we're going to stimulate her to make more ovary, or sorry, more eggs, and then we're going to take those eggs and take them out and freeze those eggs so that later they can be, um, um, you can do uh, artificial insemination, or sorry, you can do um, ICSI, where you're putting sperm into that egg for later on. Um, immature oocyte cryopreservation is um, something that is used when you're taking immature oocytes. So instead of making them mature through giving some stimulation hormones um, before you harvest them, you just harvest them as is. And this is really done if you need to harvest them like today or tomorrow and you can't really wait for a two week cycle of hormones to get those ovaries matured, or sorry, to get those oocytes matured. The last one on here is what I think is really relevant and kind of up and coming. So ovarian tissue cryopreservation is basically taking part of the tissue of the ovary, so part of the chunk of the ovary, or maybe even the whole ovary, um, and um, putting that whole ovary or whole piece of the ovary in the freezer for later, with the idea that you could either put the ovary in back in um, where it's supposed to be when you're ready to have babies, or you could possibly even get that ovary to make um, eggs or mature eggs in vitro, but that's still from a research perspective. So this is starting to be used more and more, particularly in cancer situations where um, um, girls uh, are prepubertal and they're going to undergo chemotherapy that is going to, we know, kill off their ovaries. So we could take out one of those ovaries, put it in the freezer, and then once they're done with all of their cancer therapy, we can put it back in and it will work just like a regular functioning ovary, producing hormones and producing eggs. And there has been pregnancies, a lot of pregnancies reported from that. So it is, I have on here investigation but it's not actually investigational for things like cancer and for um, certain, certain populations. 
for things um, for girls that have a high risk of premature ovarian insufficiency, um, including Turner syndrome, and then we're kind of arguing that, hey, maybe trisomy X might be in this category as well. One of the questions is, is whether ovarian tissue cryopreservation would be a useful tool um, or method for them as well. Next page. Um, this is just to show a little bit. Could you hit again? Because I think there's probably two. Is there two pictures on here? Yeah. So this is just to go over a little bit about what that procedure looks like. I am not a surgeon, but essentially they're opening up, um, going into where the, the um, the ovary is, they're taking a piece of that ovary that you can see here, and then they, um, they uh, patch it back up. Next page. They're doing it laparoscopically, I'm assuming. This is laparoscopic, yep. So this is a current protocol that's recommended for Turner syndrome based on AMH levels to determine whether or not you would you know, pursue one of these fertility preservation options. If of course you're interested, this is always a shared decision-making process. So I'm gonna start with the pubertal one because that's pretty straightforward. If you're already um, pubertal and having periods, um, then in your AMH is decreasing, um, then it, the standard of care, if you're interested in pursuing fertility preservation is to stimulate those oocytes to mature and then to, um, to preserve or cryopreserve those, those full mature over, uh, oocytes because that is the most tried and true method. Um, the prepubertal aspect of things um, is a little bit more of a, of a kind of a process that is a little bit more debated. So they use the cutoff in this particular um, recommendation scheme of an AMH of two. So if the AMH is greater than two, we say, okay, your ovarian function seems to be pretty darn good. We'll just follow AMHs over time. So they say serial AMHs. Now, how often that is every six months, every year, doesn't really um, say a whole lot. So again, we don't have a whole lot of information about what happens over time for any one individual. Um, if your AMH is less than two, then in this Turner syndrome protocol, given that we know that most girls with Turner syndrome will not make it to having full periods and will most will be infertile, um, then if, if fertility is an importance to them, the, then we recommend ovarian tissue cryopreservation um, when their AMH falls to less than two. So whether or not something like this would be um, um, be able to be used in trisomy X, we still need to do more research for, but this is kind of what the background is and what would be able to potentially be considered. Um, these are one of the considerations that you might have if you're uh, entertaining the idea of fertility preservation. Most insurances um, do not cover fertility preservation uh, options, although that is that is changing somewhat. So these are not cheap procedures, particularly if you're um, you know undergoing surgeries um, and then also long-term storage as well. And so definitely things to consider. I think that is all I have here. So I will turn it over to. Susan Howell. Thanks, Shanley. Um, so as a genetic counselor, I'm often asked, you know, when when we see patients in clinic with trisomy, oops, did the slide disappear for everybody or just me? It's still there for me. Oh, sorry. Um, so when we see patients with trisomy X in clinic, um, families will often ask about, you know, is this an inherited condition? Is this a condition that she will be at risk of having children also with trisomy X or other X chromosome um, aneuploidies or, con or concerns. And it's a rare occurrence that trisomy X would be passed on. Typically um, trisomy X occurs as a, um, a deficiency in the chromosome separating in the formation of the egg or the sperm. It's not a gene that's passed on through generations. Um, so it's a rare occurrence that a, a woman with trisomy X um, would have a child with trisomy X or um, another type of chromosomal aneuploidy, but there is really minimal data available in the literature. Um, the quoted risks in the literature range anywhere from less than 1% to less than 5% for having um, eggs with chromosomal aneuploidies when you have a mother with trisomy X. And so it's really important that we continue to learn more through ongoing research, looking at fertility and pregnancy outcomes, as well as natural history and registries to better understand what the pregnancy outcomes 
and um, and fertility outcomes for our patients um, continue to have. So when we have a woman who has um, trisomy X and there are options for genetic testing in regard to pursuing uh, pregnancy, the options include everything from pre-implantation genetic testing with in vitro fertilization. So that's actually testing the embryo before implantation. Um, again, it's expensive, much like Dr. Davis alluded to with all of the other assisted reproductive techniques. Um, but it is an additional cost. They can test the embryo to make sure that the chromosomes are typical 46 and then either XY or XX. Um, the second options are prenatal screening or prenatal testing options during pregnancy. So prenatal screening typically includes um, currently non-invasive prenatal testing or NIPT, which is a relatively new technique that started in about 2013. Um, as well as ultrasound screening of a pregnancy. And to be quite frank, neither option is really uh, great for screening for trisomy X or other X chromosome aneuploidies in pregnancy, especially when we have a, um, a mother with trisomy X. So the basis of doing non-invasive prenatal testing or NIPT is a ratio test to see if there's an increased ratio in fetal fragments that are found in the maternal blood. Um, it doesn't pose a risk to the pregnancy, but it doesn't, it's not a validated test when you're starting with a mother who has a genetic aneuploidy of trisomy X. The diagnostic tests are reliable during pregnancy, and those do include both CVS or chorionic villus sampling, which is a sample of the placenta that's collected between 10 and 12 weeks of gestation. And that sample is tested for the chromosomes. So they actually look at the chromosomes in the cells that determine whether or not the baby has the 46 typical chromosomes or if there's any concerns in regard to the chromosomes through a karyotype. As well as amniocentesis can be pursued, um, which is done as early as 15 weeks of pregnancy. And that's taking a sample of fluid from around the developing fetus um, and analyzing the cells in that fluid to look at the chromosome. So both CVS and amniocentesis are diagnostic and do give a confirmatory answer when testing a pregnancy. And then a lot of families will choose postnatal testing, um, which we also recommend even in the context of families who have had prenatal test results um, to make sure that there's direct testing on the baby as well as that it's consistent and in the baby's medical record. Um, but postnatal testing is, is commonly pursued in many situations and it's easily collected if capable um, by collecting a sample of cord blood at delivery. So we've talked a lot about kind of the science behind AMH and infertility, but when rubber meets the road, there's a lot of emotional um, context to this conversation and, and the idea of having potential in, um, infertility conversations with both the doctor and the child. So it's really important that families recognize that they are advocates and partners in care with their physicians, primary care as well as specialists, and don't undermine the value that parents know a lot about trisomy X and often even more than you know, the doctors that they're meeting with because you have a vested interest in learning about the condition, obviously you know, learning through various webinars, and a lot of this information isn't main, mainstream. I mean, a lot of physicians aren't aware of some of the nuances in caring for kids with trisomy X. So don't undermine the value of your own knowledge and partnering with your, your providers in, in trying to advocate for your daughter's needs. Um, it's important to be thoughtful about the audience and having these conversations. Obviously, medical appointments with parents and children in the room, um, they're going to hear exactly what's said and making sure that it's said in a way that you understand that they are listening um, and they, they, it's not presented in a way that's scary or that something's wrong, um, but that it's a conversation being mindful in front of a child and, and being mindful in that regard. Having the conversation with the doctor about planning. So, you know, what the plan is as far as when labs are gonna be drawn, starting at what age, how frequent, um, what labs they're comfortable ordering, what labs they'd rather have a referral to a specialist who's going to be able to facilitate next steps if they come back abnormal. And then if there is any referrals for infertility specialists or the pursuing the cryopreservation like Dr. Davis mentioned, 
that those referrals are discussed upfront just to understand kind of what the bigger plan is going to be. And lastly, it's really important that parents understand that, that there's a lot of support that needs to be considered in talking with the doctor about this. So it's natural for parents to really struggle on the topic of infertility. We hear it often in our clinic, um, feelings of fear about infertility, feelings of grief, if the infertility is um, confirmed or it looks like the AMH is trending down, um, feelings of parental guilt, and then you know disclosure. How am I going to tell my daughter? Because often these lab results are, are on a phone call with the doctor after the appointment and, and reviewing these results. So recognizing that parents need a lot of support regarding infertility and how difficult these conversations can be. Next slide. And then lastly, talking with your daughter. So much like I mentioned before, acknowledging as a parent your own emotions around the topic of infertility and being able to get comfortable with the idea of having a conversation where it's not gonna be scary to the child, um, but that you've also taken care of your own emotions and kind of come to a place where you can have the conversation. Having the conversation with her in an age appropriate as well as a developmentally appropriate way using appropriate language. So, you know, with trisomy X, we often see patients who are more immature or development, developmentally more immature um, and making sure that the language is, is scaled to their ability to understand what's being discussed. And then using an accurate explanation to avoid any kind of confusion. So when we're talking about infertility and we're talking about POI or POF and AMH, we're talking about egg production. We're not talking about female identity. We're not talking about sexual functioning. Um, all of that is, is separate from, from this topic. So what we're really talking about is eggs and, and their ability to be produced and released from the ovary. Um, it's important to address the need to continue to have safe sex. Um, not only for, you know, if we have low AMH and we're concerned about infertility, there's still a possibility, although maybe smaller, of getting pregnant, but then also to avoid contracting STDs. So we need to make sure that that's addressed in conversations when we have an adolescent in developmentally appropriate way, um, as well as having the conversation in a very supportive way. So making sure that the conversation is open, it left open to discuss more information, that you don't have to have all the answers and that's okay, but you want her as she's processing the information that's shared with her to be able to come back to you to ask additional questions. We wanna make sure that the conversation is, is framed in a way that's hopeful and very positive. Um, so we focus around what we know today versus finding out more information in the future and re realizing that framing the conversation, how she's gonna translate it on her own when she's having these conversations with potential future partners or in relationships. So we want the takeaway to be such that it's framed with hope and positive scenario. Um, that there's many options for having children, whether it's through in vitro fertilization um, or cryopreservation like Dr. Davis discussed, the options of doing donor eggs are commonly pursued um, in these situations and adoption. There, you know, families originate in many different ways and we want the take home for the girls to be very hopeful as well as positive so that they are able to recognize that they can pursue having their own family even if, if they are infertile in the future. So we will wrap up here and take any questions from the group. You're also welcome to um, email our clinic um, with any specific questions that you may have um, in regard to just general information. Again, not medical advice. Those require a medical appointment. I think before we start on the questions, I just also want to kind of talk about some of the things we don't know from the results of these studies, right? So. I mean, I think, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about um, kind of what we recommend in terms of general monitoring of ANH and, and other things in trisomy X, but one of the things that is important is that um, even though we're finding that 60 to 70% of the girls that we're testing have low AMH levels, 
um, we don't know, again, like Dr. Davis said, what happens over time. And I can tell you for sure that 60 to 70% of girls with trisomy X don't at least go on to have um, ovarian failure, you know, through their 20s and 30s, because otherwise we would hear about that and we would know it and we would, we would see cases. And so I've had one or two girls start to have irregular periods, but then, um, you know, were too young to really, and, and weren't quite um, in a place where they wanted to do fertility um, difficulties. But the majority of girls with trisomy X still have normal menstruation, normal um, cycles through adolescence and adulthood. Um, and so, you know, we still have to really think about and understand what this really means in the trisomy X population. So this is a first look. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, that's just really important to say. But now I think we'll look at the questions. Can I just yeah. add one thing to that though? I probably yeah. should add this as well, but AMH is a very early marker. So I know that there were a couple of questions in there about the importance of other hormones like estrogen. And, and you know, if you actually have premature ovarian failure, so you're not having menstrual cycles and your ovaries are not working, um, that's that your AMH level is gonna long be zero um, well before that. And yes, you definitely need to, to have those hormones replaced at that time um, from an estrogen and progesterone perspective if you get that far. So this is way before that happens. This is like looking um, at, at kind of the health of the ovary well before that. And like Dr. T said, it it may be that that girls with trisomy X just have fewer of those O sites in that particular stage that um, AMH is being made, but maybe it doesn't necessarily reflect how many they have left like it does in the general population. So there's a lot of things that we still don't know about what these, what, um, these results mean. And in these patients, their, um, when other hormones were tested, their progesterone and estrogen, they did not need, they had normal levels there, right? So they did not need hormone replacement therapy. Um, so the idea of hormone replacement therapy would be, you know, in the cases like Dr. Davis said, of more true, um, you know, extreme ovarian failure, um, which is not the case in the patients that we had in this study. All right, Dr. T, I'm going to let you answer this first question that says, is there anything anecdotal or otherwise that trisomy X women with POF experience severe pain during menses? Um, no, um, from, uh, well, I mean, I, I don't know that it's associated with POF. We definitely have some girls and young women who describe that they have pretty significant menstrual cramps. Um, but they are not necessarily experience, you know, going on to or in that group that are, you know, having POF, um, or at least not yet, right? So, um, you know, if there is severe pain during menses, there's definitely things you can do about it. Obviously, um, you know, ibuprofen. You want to really make sure you have a good workup because there can be other medical causes of severe pain during menses. And then, if a lot of those other causes are ruled out, then you can also um, you know, use hormonal treatments like birth control pills and other hormone treatments to um, kind of decrease some of the cramping and other things. The next question says, since hormone, the hormone situation of a trisomy X woman is diverse to average, are there any connections to intersex conditions? Is intersex status more common in trisomy X? I think that there's a lot of confusion with the word intersex, but um, intersex to, to us really means that there is a, um, a discrepancy in the between the genetics and the presentation, so the genitalia and or the hormones. And so, um, no, in this situation, trisomy X, we, I would not consider that an intersex condition, even with lower levels of AMH. That's not, um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Nicole, but okay. All right. Next question is, um, we already talked about hormone therapy. Um, I think that someone else asked as well is if you're on an OCP or birth control pill, can you still measure AMH? And yes, you can. Um, one of the great things about, uh, AMH is that it is kind of, it doesn't matter what time in your cycle you're at. doesn't matter if you're on birth control pills um, or receiving other hormones or therapies. AMH is kind of independent of all those things. And so you can certainly measure that at any time. Um, and it's certainly different and, and 
goes down a lot sooner in premature ovarian insufficiency than things like estrogen does. Um, do you know any doctors in the US who see young adults with trisomy X? I have to educate most of my daughter's doctors and it's frustrating, especially, oh, it went, sorry, especially since she wasn't diagnosed until she was 16 and a half. I'd like to work with somebody who already knows these things. Um, I don't know of any reproductive endocrinologists or OBGYNs who are specializing in trisomy X. The access clinics all have, um, you know, specialists in the X and Y conditions. Many of them, if the primary physician is not, um, you know, an expert in trisomy X or an endocrinologist or OBGYN, they have connections within their medical centers to make referrals. And so, um, you know, I would say that the access clinics are your best bet for getting someone who knows, but also, um, you know, a lot, if, if the idea is that you um, want to um, just be monitoring AMH, it's a different story than if you're, you know, wanting to preserve or do, you know, pursue ovarian preservation. Infertility doctors will know what to do with this, um, but it's the question of whether or not you're gonna, um, you know, get there, I think. Dr. Davis? Can a regular doctor for AMH or do you need a specialist? So yes, any doctor can test for AMH. It's just whether or not they know how to interpret it. Um, there are some different uh, lab uh, quality control things with AMH as well. It's not something that's run in general at a regular hospital. And so it's a send out lab. And so it can be a little bit more complicated for people that might not know, um, might not be familiar with, with ordering it, but certainly a pediatrician or a family practice doctor could order an AMH level. Um, question for you, Susan, do some of the eggs have double X at birth and therefore more likely to have a chromosomal abnormality or end in miscarriage? So that it's not common, but it can occur um, up to a less, what the quoted risk is in the literature is less than 5% of the time. There can be a double X. There can also be a missing X. So the presence of having trisomy X in a cell, um, while it's not an inherited condition, it can impact the ability of the, the cells, um, chromosomes separating and the production of the eggs. And so that's where that residual risk comes not only in the X chromosome, but that can also impact the whole, the whole process. So there is an, a slight increased risk um, of up to 5% for um, chromosome abnormalities in the, in the egg produced. Would premature ovarian failure have other health implications outside of fertility? So yes, definitely. If you truly have um, premature ovarian failure um, and or you know, really delayed puberty and, and don't really start puberty, um, then that's indicative that you're not making enough estrogen. And estrogen is very important for maintaining your health, particularly your bone health during your teen years and early 20s. Um, but also your cardiovascular health and your mental health. Um, so yes, premature ovarian failure is, it has more implications than just fertility, um, but the AMH alone being low to our knowledge doesn't have other implications other than being a potential marker of moving on to um, earlier premature ovarian failure. All right, the next questions, Dr. T, revolve around how soon should we test for AMH? Um, uh, is it recommended that all girls should, with trisomy X should be tested uh, for AMH? Um, I have a 14-year-old who's regularly menstruating. Should I have her AMH levels tested now, or is it better to wait? Um, a couple more about what age should we start doing this and kind of our recommendations. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, this is a tough question because it, it, it makes us take our findings and really like make a general recommendation that I'm not sure we have enough data yet to really say, okay, well, it's conclusive. Everyone needs to have their AMH checked all the time. So I can tell you what we're doing in our clinic. Um, and, um, you know, I would say it's a reasonable approach. But um, I can't say that this is like, this is evidence-based care based on multiple, multiple studies because this is on one small preliminary study in our clinic. But since we've had these findings, um, we generally have been testing teenagers who have, are either, you know, peripubertal or in their adolescence or AMH and seeing where their levels are. 
if their levels um, at the first test come back in the average range or in the normal range, then we are just recommending that it's tested every year or two years to monitor for, you know, if it seems like it's going to be falling and this is a family that would want to do something about it in terms of um, fertility preservation, then, um, you know, then we have the option of referring them to our reproductive endocrinologists or OBGYN. Um, they can be tested when they're younger, eight, nine, even, you know, infants can have this tested. But, um, you know, what we do with that, I don't really know. It's very different than Turner syndrome. Almost everybody with Turner syndrome ends up going on to have infertility. Not everybody, it's a, I mean, it's, you know, it's not zero, but it's not, certainly not everybody with trisomy X goes on to have it um, because we would then know more about it. So, you know, we can look at the guidance and what people are doing in Turner syndrome, but we also have to like really understand the difference between the fertility course and those patients. So, you know, I think right now it's reasonable to have AMH tested, especially in teenagers. I think, um, the reason for AMH testing really needs to be considered from the perspective of fertility preservation and or would you do something with it, right? There are many um, families who say, you know, we are not in a place where fertility now or in the future is something we're ready to or want to think about. Um, and so, you know, we really don't want to explore this now. I don't think we have enough evidence to push those families into doing it. Um, but there are some families and some girls who are really interested in, in motherhood and, and being a parent as they get older. And so, you know, if that's um, one of the cases, then, you know, we definitely should be monitoring every year. So it's, it's very individual um, and it's, you know, a choice related to would we do something about it if we found it. Now, the other piece that there's a lot of questions about is, um, you know, if, AMH is decreasing, like, well, sure, you know, fertility is one thing, but what about all those other hormones? And we've talked about that a little bit, you know, if there are other hormone um, deficits, then those do need to be replaced for bone health, for mental health, and all those other things. So, you know, that um, should be monitoring for sure. I think one of the other questions, and Dr. Davis, you can, um, you can answer this as well, was like, are there symptoms we should look for? Well, you know, definitely symptoms like, um, you know, we're seeing in that first case report, if you're having actual hot flashes and those things. But I think if you're having, you know, if you had regular periods and then go on to have irregular periods or you're stopping having periods or they're stretching out in time, then those are definitely things you would want to, you know, say, okay, we probably should work this up. I don't know if there's other things, Dr. Davis, you would add in there. Nope, I would say that that's exactly correct. Once you're already having periods, before you're having periods, um, if you if your daughter hasn't started um, showing breast development by the age of 13, then she should have an evaluation for delayed puberty. Um, or if she has breast development before the age of eight as well, sometimes we can see that ovary, ovaries that are um, not working like they're supposed to can uh, have some premature uh, production of hormones that then kind of poop out too early. And so I think that it's a good idea if you're, if you're outside of that normal range um, to, to have a full evaluation as well. And it might not have anything to do with your ovary function. There's lots of reasons to have delayed or early puberty, but um, that's something that I would add to that as well. Um, someone else mentioned something about symptoms like uh, moodiness or whatnot. Um, that, that, to my knowledge, I would not attribute to early um, ovarian dysfunction at all. If that was it by itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, I'm kind of losing track of where we are on the the questions. There's some questions about um, specific, like you're set, telling, asking us about your daughter, and unfortunately, we can't answer those um, because um, they are giving specific medical advice, and um, and we just can't do that over a webinar. So I'm we apologize for that. Um. 
Carol, do you see other questions that we haven't addressed anything on? I guess one of the things, there's a couple of things about the mention of two nanograms per mil being a cutoff. That was um, specific to Turner syndrome in that algorithm. And I think that I would not use that high of a cutoff for, for being concerned in um, trisomy X. I really think that you would just use the normal range, which is usually one, um, has a little bit of fluctuation with age and the assay. And so you need to look at the normal range for whatever the blood test is that you're getting um, to know if it's lower than what you would expect it to be or lower than normal. So no, I would not use that two um, nanograms per deciliter for, um, for girls with trisomy X. Um, someone asked about, you know, can we get information on the study that we can bring to our doctors? So I will tell you that in the paper, which is, you know, linked to this webinar, you can definitely print out that um, report. And at the back of the report, we do have a little summary of, you know, kind of, you know, from these results, we would, you know, generally recommend that it's reasonable to test AMH levels um, in women with trisomy X, you know, with referrals for reproductive endocrinology if families would like to pursue it, um, or just have the discussion and start having the discussion. And so, um, you know, um, so definitely print out that paper. You can give them the link to this webinar. You can, um, um, you know, show them the slides from the webinar. So there's many things I think that from the resource perspective, that's what I would recommend is bringing the paper into your doctor or emailing it electronically. <laughs> I'm very old school, right? We, we print things out and when I was young. Um, there was a question, somebody asked about as, um, Overheating or mood swings, is that associated with POF? I mean, hot flashes, I'm not sure um, overheating necessarily is. Mood swings, you know, that's a toughie in, um, in trisomy X because there, you know, are definitely high rates of um, mood conditions related to anxiety or depression or irritability. So I would not, um, you know, pursue um, you know, a lot of, or I would not, it would not raise a lot of concern related to um, ovarian function just for mood swings alone. So one of the questions is, would it be a reproductive endocrinologist to see if there's POI or POF and need for hormone therapy? So that or an OBGYN, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of locations also have, a lot of children's hospitals also have Turner syndrome clinics. And so what I would say another resource would be is that even though, again, this is very different than Turner syndrome, unless your daughter has trisomy X and a Turner syndrome cell line. So some people are mosaic and have a little bit of both. But if your daughter is just trisomy X alone, those Turner syndrome doctors at least are familiar with this, right? So they would be great resources as well. There's a lot more physicians out there who know a lot about Turner syndrome um, in the endocrinology field, the OBGYN field. Um, in our um, hospital, there's actually um, adolescent gynecology. So they're the ones who also are re um, referred for um, working with teenagers and they really understand kind of the adolescent compared to an adult doctor. Um, so there are other specialists, I think, out there who know what to do with this. They're just not going to have a lot of familiarity, unfortunately, on the trisomyx part. Certainly, though, uh, pediatric endocrinologists also routinely do premature ovarian failure, and, and the treatment for with hormones um, really falls usually onto an endocrinologist. Sometimes OB-GYN can, um, can be involved in that, too. But if you're like thinking more of the fertility realm and doing actual fertility preservation, that would definitely have to be a reproductive endocrinologist. Okay. Well, thank you um, so much for answering these questions. You know, as you said, sorry, we can't, you know, go into specifics, but certainly uh, look for the doctors on the ACCESS website and then also for the Turner Syndrome doctors. And I just want, I can't thank Dr. T and Dr. Davis and Susan enough for this fantastic webinar and for all you do for our community and for ACCESS. 
And uh, just to let you know, we'll be hearing more from them when during our conference in June. So we'll keep definitely have a session on this in June as well. And then the other thing I just want to say is just thanking all the families who participate in our studies. You know, it's really the inspiration and the questions from families who come to our clinic who then inspire us to do these research studies so that we can then learn more. And so, um, you know, sometimes we're asking for extra blood draws, we're asking for extra time, we're asking for lots of forms to be filled out in our research. But um, we want you to know we, number one, truly appreciate it and hope you see that it leads to um, results in terms of really helping your community. Thank you so much for doing this. And yes, and we're so happy to be able to share this research results with the community. And thank you to everybody who came to this webinar and asked your fantastic questions. Uh, we really appreciate you. All right, everybody, have a, have a great afternoon or evening wherever you are.